Good morning, everyone. Welcome to UCL. Welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences uh, public lecture uh, series. Today is a great privilege uh, to have uh, Professor David Lomas, who will be uh, just telling us his story about treatment for COVID-19 getting out of the epidemic, of the pandemic. So. Professor Lomas is, uh, in case you didn't know, he is a, a vice provost of health of, in UCL. He is the head of the School of Life and Medical Sciences, one of the most important uh, medical schools, certainly in the UK and in the world. And he's a respiratory medicine consultant uh, at the University College London Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and at the Royal Free Hospital. So uh, he, uh, most importantly, he's been working in the front line, uh, I guess, against the battle uh, uh, against COVID-19, and he's going to tell some fascinating stories. My name is uh, Dr. Neftali Marina Gonzalez. I work in the Faculty of Medical Sciences as well. I'm a researcher, and I'm a teacher there as well, and it will be a really great privilege to get to know some of you in the future if you, if you decide to join our courses. So for now, uh, uh, please uh, join me to welcome Professor Lomas, uh, with his talk. Professor Lomas, thank you very much for coming uh, to give us your talk today. Yes, thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining me for this uh, for this uh, short lecture. Uh, what I plan to do is to talk to you for about uh, 20 minutes, telling you about work that, that we and many people have done on the COVID uh, pandemic. And what I'd like to do is talk a bit about COVID, uh, talk a bit about where it started, talk a bit about the symptoms and signs that affect people, and then talk a bit about the new therapies that have been developed at scale in the United Kingdom. And then perhaps at the end, just how we're going to get out of this, this terrible mess that we're, we're in at the moment. So, so this is me. Uh, this is a photograph of me in full personal protective gear uh, at UCH, uh, University College Hospital seeing one of the first patients that came in with coronavirus infection back in, in March of, of this year. And, and what I want to say is that, that this is a very much a personal experience. I've seen patients with uh, coronavirus, we've looked after them, we looked after them on the respiratory unit and then the intensive care uh, unit. And, uh, and so some of this is, is personal reflections on, on the disease as well as uh, the literature. So this is what a coronavirus looks like, and you've seen this many times, I think, on, on uh, news articles in newspapers. It's a spherical structure with, with spikes, so-called spike proteins. And the spikes are very important because the spikes are the mechanism by which the virus binds the lung and enters the lungs. Coronaviruses are, are themselves very, very common. Uh, every year there's, there's common colds that affect us during the wintertime and 15 to 30 percent of those come from the coronavirus families and uh, they come every winter there's no treatment there's no vaccine uh, people go home go to bed drink hot fluids uh, take paracetamol or aspirin and slowly they, they will get better and it's a variant of this that has caused the current pandemic so coronavirus almost certainly arose in bats in china the bat is a very peculiar species. It's got an immune system that's very aggressive. So viruses have to adapt and mutate to deal with the bat's immune system. Uh, the virus can live in the bat, but can also live in this species I've shown on the top right. Uh, that's a scaly, uh, scaly creature that's called a pangolin. And both bats, bats and pangolins and other creatures are sold in wet markets, which is the bottom left picture that you can see here. The, the wet markets in China are a bit like our farmers markets in the UK. You can buy uh, bread and cheese and, and salamis from, from our farm markets. In the wet markets, you buy animals that have been brought to the market and killed fresh. So the Chinese like to buy their meat still warm. So, it's, so the animals only been freshly killed. And that allows transmission, as you can imagine, viruses from the animal to the human host and then they've gone all around the world and affected many people including as you can see here the prime minister now, i just want to if i if i may explain terminology so the virus is caused by is called sars-cov-2 and that's a severe acute respiratory syndrome 
coronavirus 2. It's the second type of coronavirus that's caused this type of severe acute respiratory syndrome. So the virus that causes the problem is called SARS-CoV-2, and the syndrome that people have is called COVID-19, coronavirus ID-19, 19 because it arose in 2019. So the virus probably started in November in Wuhan province in China in, 19, in 2019. The key event was in January uh, 2020 when it became apparent that this virus could spread between humans. And at that point, it became a real health issue. The transmission of viruses from animals to man is, of course, bad enough, but between virus transmission between humans takes us to a whole different level of challenge. Perhaps if we'd known about this earlier, we could have locked down that province in China earlier on and, and prevented transmission around the world. However, we got to that point late, it spread around the world, and now over 180 countries have been affected, 14 million people and some 600,000 deaths. And those numbers, as you will be well aware, are increasing rapidly, particularly at the moment in the United States and in Latin America. So the virus enters the lungs uh, via the nose, uh, enters the body via the nose and the lungs. Those little spikes I showed you on the virus bind to receptor proteins on the on the nose and in the lungs, and then they're internalized and then they cause their damage. They can be spread by cough droplets, or sometimes viruses can can linger on surfaces, be picked up by fingers, and then spread to noses as people put their hands on their faces. The incubation period of the virus is two to 14 days, typically about five days, and people are infectious about two days before they develop symptoms and about three days afterwards. And that's important because it means that people may spread the infection when they have no symptoms. So they're not aware that they're spreading the infection between, uh, between individuals. You'll know this from the government advertising, but the, the, the vast majority of people who have coronaviruses either have mild symptoms or have a cough and a fever. About 15 to 30 percent lose their sense of smell and with that they have abnormalities of their taste as well. So people will describe not being able to taste things as well as they, as they could before. Interestingly, only about 6 percent of people with coronavirus have a runny nose. So very simply, if you, have, if you have both influenza and coronavirus circulating in a population, if people have runny noses, they're more likely to have flu and paraflu rather than coronavirus. Coronavirus is, is an unusual cause of a runny nose. As I've described, most symptoms are mild and most people get better within a couple of weeks simply by staying at home, uh, treating themselves with paracetamol and hot drinks. From a medical perspective, the thing that we're looking out for is symptoms of breathlessness, because people who develop breathlessness may well have significant lung involvement and require hospital care. Eighty percent of people have these mild symptoms, but 14 percent have more severe symptoms that may require admission to hospital and six percent have critical symptoms requiring uh, attention in intensive care. So you can see that about 20 percent of people in a population who are affected by coronavirus may be may need admission and care from the National Health Service. The case fatality rate, i.e. the number of people that die from coronavirus, is 0.6 percent. So what that means is that 0.6 people in every 100 who are affected with coronavirus will die from coronavirus. Uh, and so turning into that larger numbers, it means that about six in a thousand people will die if they're infected with coronavirus. So let me give you some comparisons. Uh, influenza comes every winter. It has a fatality rate of about 0.1 percent. So about one in every thousand people who get flu will die, largely the elderly, largely the infirm, largely people with other abnormalities, but, but occasionally young people can die from, from flu. And in comparison, Ebola kills about 70% of people 
it affects them in, uh, in Africa, where there's relative uh, paucity of health facilities. So although, although it's significant a case, fat case fatality rate of 0.6%, it's nowhere near the sort of uh, fatality that you have for other infectious diseases, as for example, uh, Ebola. The people who typically die are, are, are similar to the people who die of influenza in many ways. They're the elderly, the infirm, the people with other uh, comorbidities, that's other illnesses. For coronavirus, the profile is largely men. 70% of people who've died have been men. The elderly, so in Italy, the average age of death was 80. It's something similar in the United Kingdom. There's a propensity for people who are overweight, People who that we, we see with the most severe illness often have underlying uh, factors such as diabetes or cancer. Sometimes we see people with heart and lung disease, liver and kidney disease. And we see an overrepresentation from the black and Asian minority ethnic group. We can debate why that's the case. It may be because uh, people from that background live in more overcrowded conditions, may have more poverty, uh, may have more comorbidities, or it may just be that being from a different ethnic background predisposes you to the effects of coronavirus. And there is some genetic evidence that, that supports that. So how do we treat coronavirus? Um, well, it's all illustrated on this slide. You can see on the top left hand uh, corner uh, the use of masks. You can see ladies here wearing quite extensive face coverings. On the right hand side, you can see the importance of washing your hands. So, and as you can see in the advert, before eating, when you come home from work, whenever you come in from the street, three times when washing your hands is of special importance. And at the bottom, there's a bar of soap, Life Boy Health Soap, that may help. And on the left hand side, in the lower part of the slide, you can see quarantine, social distancing, uh, closing of schools, uh, reducing number of people who attend uh, churches and theatres. So all of this is pretty standard for us, but you may have looked at this slide and said, gosh, this looks a bit old fashioned. This doesn't look like the sort of clothes that people wear nowadays. And in fact, if you look very carefully, this is not actually coronavirus. This is, let me see if I can move this slide on. Neff, can, you move, can we move the slide on? This is, thank you, I've got that. No, go back, go back, Neff, if I may. I've got it, that's fine, thank you. This is Spanish flu. So these are the precautions that were taken in, in 1918 at the outbreak of Spanish flu. And you might not be familiar with Spanish flu, but to give you some idea of the magnitude of the effect, some 500 million people were infected with Spanish flu in 1918. Some 30 to 50 million people died. More people died of Spanish flu in 1918 to 1920 than died in the First World War. I remember being absolutely astonished when I, when I heard that statistic. But what you're seeing is that the symptoms or the treatments that we have for coronavirus are exactly the same as the ones that we used in 1918 to treat Spanish flu. Face coverings, wash your hands, social distancing. And what do these precautions do? What do these treatments do? Well, very simply, they flatten the curve. And you've seen uh, Sir Patrick Sissons, Professor Chris Whitty talk about this repeatedly in their briefings with the Prime Minister. If the coronavirus sweeps with the population, many people are affected, 20% need to go to hospital, and the service is overwhelmed by this big peak that you can see here in purple. However, with washing your hands, social distancing, and, uh, and um, using face coverings, we can reduce that peak down to the one that you can see here. That flatter peak means that people come in and over a longer period of time, the health service can cope with that, we have sufficient resources and people can be treated appropriately. And in fact, that's what happened in most of the European countries. However, there's also been uh, clinical trials and I want to explain how clinical trials work, if I may, because these are a cornerstone of medicine and they're a cornerstone of how we decide to, to give various different groups different treatments. 
So on the left hand side, you can see a group of patients all shown as little red sticks. And we're going to assume that those patients are all the same, i.e. They're, ma they're, they're all the same gender, I male or female, they're all about all the same age and they're all affected with the same severity. And then we randomly assign them to two groups, so-called randomization. We randomize, randomly assign them either to treatment or to a control group. Treatment with a novel therapy or control group, I have no therapy. And then we follow them up, we compare the two. And in my little schematic, you can see that one of the follow-up group in the treatment arm, you can see here, has died. And in the control group, three out of the five may have died. So in this analysis, you can see that treatment causes fewer deaths than people who are not treated. And therefore, treatment looks to be effective. So this gold standard approach to medicine is a randomized clinical trial of a treatment group and a control group. And that's really important for really important for medicine. So two therapies have come out of the clinical trials for COVID-19. And they've both had a huge amount of publicity and you may well have heard of these. So the first is a drug called remdesivir. Remdesivir was actually invented some years ago to treat uh, Ebola. In the sort of trials that I've just described, remdesivir allows people to leave hospital four days earlier than people who are not treated with this therapy. So you go home with 11 days rather than, rather than within uh, 15 days. This was uh, released to great acclaim across the world, so much so that uh, President Trump bought the whole world's supply of remdesivir uh, when this result was announced. Now you can argue whether the benefit of going home after 11 days versus 15 days is really, really significant and worth the investment in a hugely expensive drug. But nevertheless, that was the first therapy uh, for, uh, for coronavirus that was shown to have an effect. Back to the clinical, clinical trials. In the UK, we've taken a different approach and we've done different clinical trials. And again, what I'm, what I'm going to describe is something you've already heard on, on the news. So the UK responded rapidly in a study called Recovery, and the logo of Recovery is on the bottom of this slide. Uh, over 11,500 patients with coronavirus were enrolled into the study, over 175 NHS hospitals in the UK. Some people received a drug called dexamethasone, which I've highlighted in red. Uh, dexamethasone has been around for years. It's a very cheap, very effective, powerful steroid. And that means it damps down inflammation wherever it may be in the body. And so the groups were randomised to receive this drug, dexamethasone, or to have no additional treatment. Now, if you have no additional treatment uh, and you're on a ventilator with coronavirus, then 41% of patients died. If you came to hospital and required oxygen for coronavirus, 25% of people died. And if you came into hospital with coronavirus and needed neither ventilation nor oxygen, about 13% of patients died. So what was the impact of dexamethasone in these groups? So this is actually taken from a scientific paper that was published this month. And what, I can show, what you can see at the top is those that had the normal therapy are shown in black, that's usual care. And you see a graph with the y-axis showing mortality or death rate, and on the x-axis, the days since they were randomised to receive either usual care or this steroid. And over the time, you can see progressively that people who received dexamethasone died less often than those that received usual care. And this was a huge triumph. It was a great breakthrough. And what it means from a medical perspective is that if we treat eight people with this therapy, with steroids, with dexamethasone, on a ventilator, we can prevent one death. That's quite a significant impact. We need to treat about 25 patients with coronavirus receiving oxygen with this therapy to prevent one death. And the beauty about this is that dexamethasone is as cheap as chips. It costs pennies to, to make and it's widely available around the world. So we now use dexamethasone for all severe patients coming in with coronavirus infection. The key 
way out of this, of course, is vaccination. I want to say a few words about vaccination, if I may. So this is measles. It's a highly, highly infectious uh, condition. If I tell you that coronavirus, uh, when an individual is affected by coronavirus, it infects about two and a half other people. Measles affects 15 other people. It's highly infectious. It moves rapidly through populations. It's deeply unpleasant. Uh, it's a nasty rash. It can affect hearing. It can affect eyes. It can cause brain damage in, in some people. And, uh, and I actually had measles as a child because the vaccine did not arrive in the UK until about 1968. The vaccination works beautifully. It has very few side effects and it gives complete protection. There is no reason why everyone in the world should not be vaccinated against measles. On the top, you can see, uh, on the right, you can see three illustrations. On the first one, a, health, a healthy population not vaccinated in blue, two infectious people with the measles, and look what happens. The whole population is infected hugely with measles as it spreads rapidly through the population. If you if you immunize some of the population and they're shown in, in yellow, then you reduce the number of people who, uh, who are infected as measles spreads through the population. If you vaccinate over 90% of the population against measles, then when two people here develop measles, then not even the people who are susceptible will become infected. You'll have less, fewer people becoming infected because there's not people to transmit the virus, so-called herd immunity. And you've heard, immun you've heard about herd immunity at the outbreak of coronavirus. But you need about 90% of the population to be vaccinated to prevent spread of measles in this population. So vaccination works, it works brilliantly for some conditions, it's the gold standard. How are we doing with coronavirus? Well, it's a challenge. Uh, there's 170 com companies developing vaccines for coronavirus. Three are now in large scale clinical trials, including those from Oxford, Oxford and AstraZeneca. And you've heard about them regularly on the news. Uh, they seem to work in that they produce an immune response in the body, but we need to show that they protect against disease and they protect against transmission. And we don't have that data as yet. And the key thing you need to remember is that 95% of all vaccine trials fail. I've been a doctor since the mid 1980s. I, I started off looking after patients with HIV. All these years later, we still don't have vaccine for HIV. We've, there is no vaccine for coronavirus ever being produced to date. So this is my final slide. Um, what's the way out? Well, if it all goes well, we have a vaccine. The vaccine stops transmission between, between individuals and we can then go back to life as normal. The vaccine may have limited effects. That means that some people who develop a coronavirus infection don't develop severe disease. It doesn't block transmission, but I'll take that. I'll take anything that reduces the severity of disease and reduces people coming to hospital. That would be fine. My worry is that none of the vaccines will work. It's a tricky virus to develop a vaccine for. And any, any viral protection from a vaccine will be limited. If that's the case, we live in a world of detailed track and trace, limited lockdowns and expanded NHS provision. It's a thing called becoming endemic. It lives in the population, but we learn to live with it as we do with so many other diseases. I think finally, we do need to close down the wet markets in China. There are there are uh, there are a source of transmission of viruses or infectious disease between animals and humans. We have to bring that to a close. And as you've seen, we desperately need to improve our public health and prepare preparedness for pandemics. This is one pandemic. It's caused real chaos. There will be more in the future and we need to be better prepared. So with that, Nef, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any, any questions. Nef, I can't, I can't hear you. You might be on mute now. <laughs> Nef, we can't, I don't think I can hear you, Nef. You're still muted, Nef. Nef, you're still on mute. I don't think we can hear you, Nef, for whatever reason. Neff, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. 
you're struggling a bit, I think. So Neff, do, do you want to turn the slides off? Turn the slides off. Um, and then, then maybe if I can see the questions, I can read them out. If you go to the Q&A section, David, you'd be able to see them. OK. My, my, my mouse is not, was not working okay. properly. Yeah, really? I'll, I'll read the, uh, the questions. We um, hear you, Neff. That's great. You're back on. Yeah. Um, can the virus infect, infect you through the, the eyes? Probably yes. So, so, so the virus can infect through all mucous membranes, as we would call it. The eyes are a moist mucous membrane. Uh, the, you, you can probably have the aerosol penetrating the eyes and causing infections. And, and you will have heard people talking about the fact that face masks provide some protection. But actually, if you really want to have full protection, you may need to protect the eyes as well. And certainly in clinical practice, we have face masks, as you will have seen, in, in full visors to protect the virus getting into eyes. Mm. OK, yes, thank you. So why is it, another question, why is it that some random people who are perfectly fit and healthy are affected worse than others? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So um, there is no doubt that the people who are most severely affected are the elderly, the infirm, people with cancer, lots of diabetes and people who are overweight. There's no doubt about that. And we've seen that repeatedly in different studies from around the world. However, the question is that the questioner is absolutely right. There are occasionally younger people, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who are affected and can die. But fortunately, it's very rare. Whenever we see things like that, we think perhaps there's something around the genes, some genetic predisposition that, that means that those people are in some way more susceptible to developing uh, coronavirus and dissociated symptoms. Mm, yeah, OK. And uh, another question here, is it true that there is no real immunity to COVID-19 or that this wears off after a, pe after a period of months? And if so, why is this? Yes, yeah, a really good question. And, and the question is absolutely right. So if I go back to my starting point, we, we see coronavirus infections often every year. So people will do, be infected with coronavirus and uh, they get better. They develop an immune response. It tends to wear off after 12 to 18 months. And it's a virus uh, that, that has a transient effect. So people who have coronavirus and have bad symptoms do have an immune response. You can see antibodies. But the data suggests that they're wearing off after six or 12 months. And it's just different between different viruses. For measles, for example, two vaccinations and you have protection for life. For, um, for coronavirus, even if, you have the, even if you have infections, which is a huge dose of coronavirus, you only have transient immunity. It passes off after about six or 12 months. And that's that's the way that the body reacts to this particular virus. Mm. Yeah, that's probably the most worrying thing, obviously. Um, so how does remdesivir work to treat COVID-19? Another question from the audience. How, how does it work? It's an antiviral. Yeah, it's a good question. It's an antiviral. So the, the two therapies that I talked about, remdesivir and dexamethasone, have different approaches. Uh, remdesivir blocks viral replication, so it's, a, it's an antiviral, so it prevents the virus replicating, reduces the number of viruses, therefore reduces the, the burden on the, on the individual and reduces symptoms. The dexamethasone works by a different way. Dexamethasone is a steroid, so it damps down the inflammation. It appears that what's happening with coronavirus is that it gets into the lungs and then there's a, a very vigorous immune response which is trying to get rid of the virus, but also causes collateral damage to the lungs and other organs. And steroids, dexamethasone, seems to dampen down that inflammatory response. Mm, yeah, OK, that's, that's a really good point. Uh, another question here, what, what is the difference between fatality rate of yeah. infections and case fatality ratio? So they're the same. So basically, the, the, the case it's a standard epidemiological analysis. So case fatality rate is the same thing. It's, it's if anyone is infected with a certain virus or affected by a certain disease, how many die? And it's it's given as a percentage. So out of 100 people infected with coronavirus, 0.6% will die. And that actually means, as you can imagine, six out of a thousand people who are infected by coronavirus will, will die. That's the case fatality rate. Mm -hmm. OK, yes, thank you. Uh, another question here, does the viral load affect the incubation period? Ah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I don't think we know that. Uh, so so, so um, I think the incubation period is fixed. So I think it's going to be around, 
it's going to be around about five days, as we said. But you can imagine that if you have a bigger dose of virus, then the incubation period may be shorter. In Wuhan, when we started, uh, we saw that doctors were dying in increasing frequency. So doctors and nurses and people who, die, who treated patients on the front line. And that was probably because there wasn't enough PPE and people were being exposed to larger doses of the virus. So when they had it, they didn't have a chance to develop any immunity. It was a big dose of the virus that overwhelmed the immune system in an individual and caused and caused death. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's, and there's a really good question here. The coronavirus is mutating. What does yeah. that mean for a vaccine? Yes, yes, that's a really good point. So coronavirus actually um, mutates quite slowly. Uh, the, the UCL is actually leading the research on the sequencing of the coronavirus and work from our labs, which feeds into SAGE and then into the government, shows that there is, it's slowly mutating over time. Um, that as, as viruses mutate, then they may escape any protection that you have from a vaccine, and that's always the worry. But coronaviruses mutate slowly, and in comparison, for example, influenza mutates rapidly. So often within, uh, uh, within individuals, uh, influenza can mutate, which means you need a new influenza vaccine every year for the strain that's emerged. So yes, yes, uh, mutations are a problem, Yes, they will emerge, but it's not the sort of magnitude of problem that we would have, for example, with influenza. OK, that's that's a really good thing to know. Then. Um, another question here, what do you think we should improve in the NHS and healthcare system to prevent further yeah. epidemics and pandemics? So uh, there will be an enormous public inquiry about what's happened over coronavirus. And um, I think one of the areas that will be signaled for particular praise is the NHS. And, that, and that's absolutely right. So in March of, of this year, we, we closed down many routine practices to focus on coronavirus. The NHS was not overwhelmed. The NHS coped. Uh, we were not in difficult situations of trying to decide who should go on a ventilator and who shouldn't, as they were, for example, in Italy and in other countries. So we, we did really well. The NHS itself did, did really well. And I'm very proud of that response. And I think we should all be very proud of that response. But the thing preceding it is public health. So, so what you're seeing is the NHS mopping up the problem of people coming to hospital. Public health is far wider than illness. It's wellness as well. So we need to think about how we can actually have people have leading healthy lifestyles. We need to stop people smoking or encouraging stopping smoking, alcohol in moderation, exercise, keeping weight down, all those things that we know improve health. So that public health message we need to get across. We also need to, 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 what, to, to increase the sort of surveillance from Public Health England so that we know that when viruses are coming, we can start ramping up the testing and tracing, which is so critical to any, any pandemic. So, so what I'm saying is the hospital bit did very well. It's the bit before that, the public health system that we really need to invest in to try and keep people well rather than dealing purely with illness. Mm, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's always going to be the, the main, the main challenge, I guess. And a big challenge at the moment. This question is really relevant. When we start going back to school, is is it predicted that the rate of infection will go up again? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Um, so, in, influenza. If I go back to influenza and 1918, influenza spread rapidly amongst school children. And, and if you have a bad influenza outbreak, closing schools is really important to stop it spreading amongst children and then being transmitted to their parents and grandparents who then may die. So, so, so children are a reservoir for infection for influenza. Right? So influenza. Now for coronavirus, it appears that children actually, the death rate in children has been trivial, hard, hardly at all. So children have very, very mild symptoms aren't really affected. So, so for me, I would have opened the schools a lot faster. There's, there's, there's almost no risk to children, very, very small risk to children. The bigger risk actually is to their teachers who are, who are a bit older, a bit, more, a, bit, a bit more vulnerable. But for school children themselves, teenagers, 20s, actually the symptoms they have are, are mild or, or, or hardly, hardly existent. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine that that's going to be the main challenge. Uh, and the teachers, the ones that are going to be the, the teachers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my son's a teacher, so I'm very keen that teachers are protected. 
Oh, no, I know. We're as you know, we, we're teaching and we're encouraging all, all, all our wonderful audience today to join us in UCL in one of our programs. But uh, definitely that's that's going to be a, a big challenge for us. Yeah. Um, a really interesting question. Personally, I find it interesting because um, I, 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 have, I developed COVID and, and this is one of my main concerns. Um, uh, is it true that a COVID-19 patient could develop longer term respiratory conditions as a result of contracting the virus? So Neff, this one's for you, Neff. This one's this, this one's for you. This, this is a setup question. That's it. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so for Neff, you will be fine because because mm. because you had I would imagine had mild symptoms, cough and fever, and you got better. You'll you will, I would imagine be absolutely fine and have no symptoms. I'm making assumptions now, but you'll be fine. However. There are a group of patients who have severe coronavirus infection, who go to intensive care, have, have lung inflammation and fibrosis, who are profoundly affected. If you have a period of time in intensive care on a ventilator, you are profoundly affected by that experience in terms of respiratory reserve, lung fibrosis and just muscle loss as well. It takes about a month to recover for every week that you spend on a ventilator in ITU. And, and I'm part of a, a big national study that's led from Leicester, I, I co-chair the steering committee, that's going to follow up patients with coronavirus to try and address the question that's just been asked. So what is, what are the complications of coronavirus? What are the complications particularly for the lung but for other systems as well? And what provisions do we need to put in place long term to try and minimise those symptoms and features? Mm. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, that's that's really reassuring to know. Thank you. Yes. Now, there's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there's a big controversy at the moment, especially in the United States, about masks. So this question is relevant to that. Are masks really effective? Yeah, OK, so that's it. So we've got a bit stuck on this, haven't we? Uh, so if you go back to March, April, uh, there was lots of people saying, well, we don't know. Masks, masks seem to be quite sensible. However, if you don't put the mask on properly, uh, then then you may expel virus. If you've got a wet mask, if you've coughed and coughed because you've got a wet mask, then actually that may be full of coronavirus. If you've got, if you've got, the, if you're infected, then it gets on your fingers. You spread it on different on different surfaces. And other people will say, as we as we addressed earlier on, well, actually coronavirus can probably enter through the eyes, so a mask isn't going to protect your your eyes. Mm -hmm. So 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 the the jury is out in terms of hard evidence. But for me personally, and this is my personal view, wearing a mask seems very sensible, and I'm wearing a mask not to protect me actually it's to protect you so if i have coronavirus symptoms and a cough and i cough i'll cough into my mask and i will protect you from getting those can get from getting coronavirus so for me it's a courtesy it's hygiene it's politeness it's good etiquette but i'm wearing my ass, mask my mask to protect you rather than protecting me now mm -hmm. hospital the hospital and, and hospital the masks i wear on the respiratory unit are particularly high quality Masks that keep out virus. There are filtered. There are filtered to keep the viruses out because I'm working closely with patients who are infected and therefore have high concentrations of coronavirus. So in the hospital, I'm wearing it to protect me. But normally, when you see the mask that I wear, actually made by my wife, actually, then then it's to protect other people if I have the infection. Exactly. It's about protecting other people. No, it's not about yourself. Yeah, this is why, why it's becoming so difficult. An uh, uh, interesting question here. Um, is it true that blood type has a, yeah. a, a strong correlation to severity of disease? Yeah, that's a really that's a very clever question that actually. So, um, so there is some data that suggests if you're a blood type, then you may have more severe disease. And actually, only yesterday, only yesterday, Neff's working out whether he's a blood type and whether whether. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually. <laughs> okay. So, so a I, negative fact. So, so I was at, I was at the Genomics England meeting yesterday where we looked at the first data for, of, of genomics of patients with coronavirus, and there was an initial report I think from the United States I think it came from suggesting that a blood group the blood group type A was associated with more severe symptoms. We couldn't see that in the data we looked at yesterday. So I think we have to say it's an interesting observation, hasn't yet been confirmed by, uh, by other studies. But it's a jolly good question. Mm, OK. Um, another question here. Um, are the tests accurate? There's a lot of discussion about testing as well. Uh, how accurate are they? Two types of tests, if I may. 
So there's a thing called the antigen test, which isn't really an antigen, it's a swab test, but let's let's call it a swab or antigen test because that's that's what you see reported. And the swab test is the one that you put up your nose or your, your back of your throat or you look at saliva and you're looking for evidence of the virus. That's a difficult test to do. So, so without going into too much details, the swab has to detect the virus. So you have to take the swab properly. You have to get the virus on the swab. Then it has to go to an assay where you, where the virus has to be amplified and then detected. And, and for what it's worth, it's called reverse transcriptase PCR, RT-PCR. And that's a difficult technique, right? So that has a failure rate as well. So, so, so you, in order for the swab or antigen test to work, the whole chain has to work. You have to, you have a, have, the swab has to be taken properly. The detection has to be efficient. And then you have to have a result that, that's fed back. And it, I think it's about 70% accurate, there or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Antibody test, which basically says, have you had coronavirus? You have your antibody test done, then that's about 99% uh, uh, sensitive. So that's good. So that just says, I've had coronavirus. But as we talked about earlier on, doesn't know what that means. If I do your antibody test, it should be positive. It should say, I've had coronavirus. It doesn't mean I'm protected. It doesn't mean that it's going to last forever, but it says you've had it. Exactly. But what it's worth, I've had my antibody test and I'm negative. So despite working on the unit, seeing patients, I'm still negative for coronavirus. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. OK, well, Professor Lomas, I think it's time to close the session. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a really inspiring and fascinating session. And to all of our participants, we have over 500 participants today. Thank you very much for joining us. And, and please keep an eye uh, on, on this lecture series. We're going to make a, a break during the summer so you can all enjoy your holidays. And we'll come back uh, uh, at late, uh, probably late September early October so you'll hear from us with uh, uh, with another series of really fascinating lectures so please join us in the future in the meantime enjoy your summer and thank you very much for your attendance thank you thanks very much thank thanks you. everyone for joining us